Before we start today's symposium, I would like to introduce you Hafiz Abdul Zak Ibrahim Kokeya, who will recite a verse of the Holy Quran as it customary for us to start any function with the verse of the Holy Quran. I'll ask Hafiz Abdul Razak to recite a short verse of the Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I'm not a 
ashabul jannah ashabul jannah humul fa
السلام الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المغيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر والله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله عما يشركون والله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المغيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون والله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى والله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى سبح له ما في السماوات والأرض والله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم يسبح له ما في السماوات السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم <تصفيق> Firstly, I would like to welcome you all.
for taking your time off to listen to the subject of today. As you know, today's subject is the concept of God um, between the two speakers. It's a symposium by Swami Agniresh and Ahmed, Brother Ahmed Dida. Unfortunately, uh, Swami Agniresh could not come, or oh, he's not here. Uh, we know that uh, for a reason we cannot explain. It's between Agniresh and the Hindu community. But, uh, but we have Uncle Dida here. So, Brother Dida will be delivering his talk as scheduled. So, we'll ask. But then, any further ado, we we'll ask Sheikh Ahmed Dida to deliver the rest of it. Alhamdulillahi wahda. Wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabi ba'da. Allahumma ya mufattuhu al-abwaab. Wa ya musabibu al-asbaab. Wa ya dalil al-hayirin. Tawakkaltu alayka ya rabbul alameen. Wa ufawbidu amri lallah. Inna allaha basirun bil ibad. Mr. Chairman. My dear brothers and sisters, and my dear children, I might just reiterate that this was supposed to be a symposium. A symposium is not a debate. A symposium is that where more than one person speak on the same subject from their respective point of views. And as such, this meeting was organized for that. And it arose out of a letter that we had received from the Arya Prithid Nidhi Sabha that they had sent us a circular offering that look if you, this man, Swami Agnivesh is coming to South Africa to a conference and if you people want you can organize a debate, a discussion, a workshop and on and on and on whatever you would like to do with our Swamiji you can do. So we responded, telling this sabha that, look, a debate is out of the question. Because Hinduism is not a threat to Islam. It's not a challenge to Islam in this country. But rather that we have a symposium where the Muslim will have a chance of listening to the Hindu concept of God. And to the Hindu also listening to the Muslim concept of God and the Muslim to listen to the Hindu concept, either way, both sides. That both will be educated. It's not a debate, it's not scoring points, it's not passing judgment, no adjudicators are required. And they were very happy, very happy with our suggestion that it be a symposium, not a debate. Although they had mentioned the word debate, he said no debate. And we started to advertise and we advertised, alhamdulillah, you know, despite the fact that so much contrary news has been broadcast about nothing going to place, there's no meeting taking place, we have a hall full, alhamdulillah. Now I had the good fortune of speaking to Swamiji personally this morning and five o'clock again this afternoon. And I found him to be a charming gentleman. I'm sure I wouldn't have regretted embracing him. If he was here, embracing him on the stage, I would have had no regrets whatsoever. Charming gentleman. He cried. He's crying. He said, look, he's constrained. He wants to fulfill. He's a gentleman. He's, a, he, he's not ashamed to, he's not afraid to back out of this. But the society around him, they had forced him into a situation where the poor man can't make a move. He's a guest in this country. So I suggested to him, I said, look, if we can't get together here, what about in India, in our motherland? Oh, he was elated. I said, in Delhi, we have a symposium. And this time I said, you organize it. You organize it. I organize this here at my expense. You organize it in Delhi. And I'll be prepared to fly down at my expense. Everything. And we have a symposium there in India. And inshallah, God willing, you know, in history, it has never happened before. That a Muslim and a Hindu can share a platform. It hasn't happened. And it was going to happen here tonight. <laughs> but now, Allah didn't will it. But he said, it can happen in India. 
that a Muslim and a Hindu in a thousand years it hasn't happened. Debates have taken place between Muslims and Hindus. Debates. But symposiums, never. Here is an opportunity in a thousand years, he says, now we are prepared to stand up before the public and deliver your message as to what this concept of God each party has. <coughs> Swamiji, Swami Agnivesh, this is the picture they had given it to us, from which we produced the pamphlets. He's quite a handsome gentleman. And I asked him about his name this morning. I said, Agnivesh. You know, I said, Agni, I know. I know the word Agni. Agni means fire. But I said, Vesh, I don't know. I have some ideas, suspicions about what it means, but I really don't know. Will you please explain to me what is Agni Vesh? Agni is fire. What is Vesh? He says, Vesh in Sanskrit means the embodiment, the embodiment of a quality. Agni Vesh, embodiment of fire. The nature of fire is to burn. It burns, serves a purpose, it does harm, but generally it's doing good. Without fire, all these civilizations you see around us you wouldn't have existed. Without fire, without heat, all this metal that went to make these things, everything, everything that you see there, nothing would have worked. Your stoves, your fridges, fire, fire, fire. And he was the embodiment of fire, but he has been such a fantastic person that I'm looking forward to meeting him again personally this time. Coming to the topic of this evening, the concept of God in Islam. Concept of God in any religion. I have a statement here before me by Samuel Zwemer. Samuel Zwemer is the founder of the Zwemer Institute in Pasadena, America. That institute is solely directing its activities towards the Muslims, to convert the Muslims of the world. The Zwema Institute. The founder of that institute, Samuel Zwema, he makes this statement. He said, no religion is higher than its concept of God. No religion is higher than its concept of God. The height of your religion depends upon your concept. What do you think of God? Whatever the height of that level of your thinking, your apprehension, that is the level of your religion. But when a person moots an idea, he propounds a theory. It presupposes that the person believes that his is the highest. Otherwise, who makes such a statement? If a Hindu made such a statement, at the back of his mind, Hinduism has the highest concept. If the Muslim made such a statement, it presupposes that the Muslim believes that the Muslim is the highest concept of God. And if a Christian makes such a statement, it presupposes that Christianity has the highest concept of God. And I have no hesitation in agreeing with this proposition. That the highest concept of God, the higher the concept, the higher your, your religion. Now, if I were to do, which is a natural thing to do, is to go to the Quran and tell the people, Muslims and non-Muslims, said we have the highest concept. We Muslims are the, and this anybody would do. The Christian will do the same, the Hindu will do the same. Everybody is natural for them to boast that my concept, my book has the highest concept. But now, I said, if I can get it from the mouth of the opposition, this testimony, then it would mean something real. Because it is natural for each individual, his religious concept to say is the highest and the best. And in this I am going back to 1776. At a time when the whole Muslim world was down in the gutters. 1776. Edward Gibbon, the master historian, he wrote his encyclopedia called the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, 1776. And in it, his encyclopedia, he says, that the creed of Muhammad, the idea, the philosophy, the principles of the teachings of this man, Muhammad, 
is free from the suspicions of ambiguity and the Quran and the Quran is a glorious testimony to the unity of God this is coming from the mouth of the Westerner the Christian he says that Edward Gibbon ambiguity <coughs> having more than one possible meaning to a thing. You say something and you mean one thing and you also mean something else. Ambiguity. You're not very clear cut. Islam, he says, the creed of Muhammad is free from that. There's no ambiguity. It's clear cut, straightforward. Anything what it says, it says for what it says. It has no dual meanings. When the Christian would say, it says, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, says these three are not three, but one. Now that's ambiguity. No, Islam has no such things. To give you a crude example of ambiguity, when you use some words and you mean something else, I give an example of a lady, a lady who says that no man is good enough for her. A lady, a woman, who says no man is good enough for me, she says. So we say she may be right and she may be left. <laughs> she may be right. And she may be left. She may be left on the shelf. She may never get a husband. You see? But now I say, she may be right and she may be left. It's got double, double meaning. Can you see? Double, double. That's ambiguity. In Islam, the creed of Muhammad, according to Gibbon, has no ambiguity. Clear, cut, straightforward. If it says one, it's one. Indivisible, indivisible. In his quality and his nature, is absolutely unique. When you say he's unique, he's unique. There's nothing like him that you can think or imagine. Then, some years later, in 1854, Lamartine, the, a, a French historian, he wrote the history of the Turks. And the Turks, incidentally being Muslims, he started speaking about our Nabi Karim Sarasam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, and his concept of God. And this is what he says in his book, The History of the Turks. The idea of the unity of God, proclaimed amidst the exhaustion of fabulous theologies, was in itself such a miracle that upon its utterance from his lips, it destroyed all the ancient superstitions, his endless prayers, his mystic conversations with God, his death and his triumph after death. All this attest not to an imposture, but to a firm conviction which gave him the power to restore a dogma. This dogma was twofold based on the unity of God and the immateriality of God. His unity and he's not a material being. He's not physical. And the immateriality of God. The former telling what God is and the latter telling what God is not. What he is and what he is not. <coughs> and coming to modern days, modern times, this current, current affairs, His Holiness the Pope Pope John Paul II. He's just published a book, written a book, called Crossing the Threshold of Hope by Pope, His Holiness, Pope John Paul II. I am just inquisitive. How many of you own this book? Please put up your hand. If any of you, you own this book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope by Pope John Paul II. Anybody who owns this book in this hall, just put up your hand. I won't, you, I won't be asking for it. I just want to know whether you own it. Anybody, please put up your hand. Not one. You have it, sister? Good. One lady has it, alhamdulillah. Can you imagine that in this packed hall, only one person, she has it. Are you a Muslim, sister? You must be a Roman Catholic. No, great. No, she is not a Roman Catholic, but she owns a book. She is not a Muslim. Now, I am offering, <laughs> starting with my sisters, I am offering you 100 rands to any of my sisters here, who at question time can give me two reasons why a Muslim is not likely to have this book. Two reasons. There are two reasons. You just give me that two, those two reasons, and I'll give you a hundred rounds. 
Now, no, he said, I'll give you a hundred rands, just give me two reasons why a Muslim is not likely to have this book. <laughs> I have it, but I have a reason. How I got it, I was set up, I was actually set up to have this book. You know, this book here cost 59.99. If you gave 60 rands, you get one cent change. <laughs> this is the one. 60 rand you give for this, you get this one cent change. You know how valuable this is in comparison. I'm offering you this book here. Look, gold embossed. Hardcover, gold embossed. Silk paper, silk paper. I give you 12 of this for this one. For the price of this one. For 60 rands, I give you 12 of these books. 12 of these books for 60 rands. And I'll give you that one cent change if you want it. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'll give you that one cent. If you want that one cent change, I'll give you that one cent change. 60 rands for 12. So, but I found something wonderful in this book. A jewel on page 92. Page 92 of the Pope's book. This book has become a bestseller today. In America, within weeks of its publication, they sold 1.6 million. 1 million and 600,000 of these were sold within weeks. It's the world's bestseller today. 59.99. On page 92. His Holiness the Pope. He says, some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Qur'an. No, wallah, we Muslims should kiss his hands. You know that? Some of the most beautiful names in the human language, which includes his Bible. In the human language, there is nothing in any world scripture to his knowledge. Maybe if Swami was here, he might have said, no, also in my book, also something better, superior to what you are saying. It, it's possible, it's possible. But now the Pope says, in the human language, in his experience, there's nothing like what is in the Quran. Some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran. He must have read it. He must have read the Quran or somebody told him. And the Qari was confirming it, his statement. Some of the verses which he read, beautiful, beautiful, like the voice from heaven, Alhamdulillah. I'm quoting from Surah Hashar. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Huwa Allahu Ladi La Ilaha Illa Hu. He is Allah, besides whom there is no other God. Al Malik. The King, Al-Quddus, the Holy One, As-Salam, the source of peace and perfection, Al-Mu'min, the guardian of faith, Al-Muhaymin, the preserver of safety, Al-Aziz, the exalted in might, Al-Jabbar, the irresistible, Al-Mutakabbir, the supreme. Subhanallah, Amma Yushrikun. Glory be to Allah. Free he is from the things that they attribute to him. Who Allah, He is Allah, Al Khalik, the Creator, Al Bari, the Evolver, Al Muthab, the Bestower of Forms and Colors, Al Asmaul Husna. These are the most beautiful names. The Pope says some of the most beautiful names in the human language are given to the God of the Quran. <laughs> He's confirming the Quranic statement. Now, And everything that is in the heavens and the earth that declare, declare his glory. And he is the exalted in might, he is the wise, full of wisdom. Surah Hashar, that's chapter 59, are numbers 23 and 24. In this few brief sentences, I gave to you 14 different attributes. 14 different attributes. Beautifully set. Not like in a dictionary, dead, 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 you know, this word, that word, that word, mm, no, no. 
14 beautiful attributes woven in a most beautiful language. Not only beautiful names, attributes, but in a beautiful language. And in Islam, in the Quran, we are given 99 attributes. And you come across the most enlightened professor of theology. And you ask him, sir, how many attributes can you think of God? Come, come. From your head, from your learning, from your past experience. I want to hear. And no professor can go beyond a dozen. Do you know that? No professor. I, I, I can challenge people. Come, come and tell me. Give me some attributes of God. I gave you 14 already. And there are how many more? To make 99. There are 99 attributes in the Holy Quran. It's a miracle. That a person who is unlettered, who doesn't know how to read or write, he's creating a book, and in that book he's weaving here, there, 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 and he's giving you in total 99 attributes, qualities. And these qualities are his. They are part of him. They do not exist outside of him. See, the Greeks, the Greeks, they had a concept of God. And in their concept, they said Jupiter, I don't know you heard the name, Jupiter was the god of heaven. Pluto was the god of hell. Vulcan was the god of fire. Neptune was the god of the sea. Mars was the god of war. And so on. And Zeus was the father of all these gods with his many wives and many children. And he was sitting on some planet in the universe, in the skies. And he was sending his sons into the world, his Apollo, his Horus, his Isis, his Osiris, as the need arose. So he, they, the Greeks, have been personifying the qualities that to God belongs the heaven and, heaven and earth belongs to him, hell and heaven belongs to him. Everything is his, says the Muslim. He is al Jabbar, the irresistible. But you can't take this quality of being irresistible and say this is God. He is just. The symbol of justice we see on our TVs, the scale, symbol of justice. But you can't say this is God. See, the symbol of justice is the scale you see daily on your TV. But that symbol, that's, that is not God. He is wise. You can't take wisdom out and say this is God. Like we, we possess so many qualities. The man is kind, he is generous, you know, uh, he's tall, he's loud. Like Ahmad Dida, he speaks loud. <laughs> hmm. If the mic fails, you can still hear me at the back. Well, this is Allah has blessed me. But you can't take loudness out and say this is Didat. You can't say height out and say this is Didat. <laughs> no, no, Didat is tall, Didat is loud, Didat is <laughs> very photogenic. My wife says I'm very photogenic. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But you can't take this photogenic out and say this is Didat. This is not Didat. So you see, the qualities of God are not separable. They are not existing outside of Him. They are His, Him, part of Him. And the beauty, the beauty of its expression, Bismillah rahman He is a Samuel Basir. Some other qualities besides the 14. He is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. He is al-latif al-khabir. He is the subtle, the finest of mysteries. And he is the aware. He is al hayyul qayyum He is the living. He is al-qayyum, the self-subsisting. He is al-ghafur al-wadud. He is the forgiving, the loving. These are all his qualities, 99 different attributes, which are his, which do not exist outside of him. But the miracle of this 99 is the one it hasn't got. See, when we say, look, Muhammad was able to give you 99 attributes, and this is from God, the man says, no, 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 no. See, he was a mighty genius. If I can do 10, Muhammad can do 99. We take over hat to him. He's great. But this is not from God. This is his cleverness. The Muslim says, you see, the miracle is the one he kept out. The one that is not there. Because in the first half a dozen, you give anybody the choice of thinking, imagining attributes, in the first half a dozen, he will think of the Father in heaven. 
The Father in heaven. The Father in heaven. The word Father will be one of those qualities that you are conjuring up in your head. The Father. The Father. The Father in heaven. The amazing thing. Muhammad, the Prophet of God, through him Allah gives us 99 attributes, but Father is not one of them. Father is not one of them. The commonest thing that thing is being dangled before him all the time. During his 23 years of his prophetic experience, from 40 to 63, he is giving us these verses, these attributes. But Father is kept out. Why? Because it had acquired other connotations. By itself, there's nothing wrong. Beautiful. The Father in heaven to me is a beautiful expression. But it has acquired other connotations. And in languages, words change their meanings. You see, we are talking, when I was going to school, and as a schoolboy, I was taught poetry. You must, people must have also learned poetry. And in one of the poetries that I learned was a song we used to sing as little boys. It says, gentle lords and ladies gay, on the mountain dawns the day. I don't know whether you people heard that. <laughs> gentle lords and ladies gay, on the mountain dawns the day. And you're talking to people, says a very happy and gay fellow. He's very jovial, gay, he's happy, gay. Today, today, I say, Mr. Chairman is very gay, he'll punch me on the jaw. I said, sir, what the hell? I said, no, look at the dictionary meaning, the original dictionary meaning. In the dictionary, the thing is, it means a homosexual today. Gay means a homosexual. But it didn't mean that. The first time as I'm growing up, I'm reading the newspapers, as I'm growing, wow, mature, and I'm coming across expressions like gay. You know, in the newspapers, talking about gay. And I kind of said, what are you talking about gay? What is gay? What? Gay. No, I, I can't grasp the meaning. Because I don't know it's talking about homosexuals. You see? So, now, you don't use that word anymore. The word comrade in America. Anybody said, this guy, he's com address you. He says, comrade Clinton. Finish. He's finished. <laughs> you know, he'll be counted as a commie and he'll be taken up and you know, interrogated and what and what do. Commie, commie means a communist. Comrade, was the guy who says comrade, use the word comrade, it means, it's a beautiful word, comrade, fellowship, companionship, sahaba. No, but when you say comrade in America, describing somebody as a comrade means he's a commie, he's a communist. Can you see? Words change the meanings. So this word father, father is being used by a great section of the believers in this world for God Almighty saying that Jesus is the only begotten son begotten not made he is the father he is the father of Jesus Christ physically he is the father not like Adam Adam was made by God every dog pig and donkey was made by God but Jesus is not like that he is begotten by the father because of that concept, the Holy Quran kept it out. 99 attributes, Father is not one of them. Where is God? Where is He? Where is He? We say He permeates the whole universe. A Persian poet, he put it this way, is a man, nagunjam darzami no asama. Man, nagunjam, darzami no asama, that the heavens and the earth cannot contain me. Dardile momin bagunjam beguma, but the heart of the momin, the faithful, can most assuredly contain me. This is a transliteration of the hadith of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, that the heart of the mu'min is the throne of Allah. But he is not contained. He is not contained in anything. He is not contained anywhere. He permeates the whole universe. There is not a place that you can imagine where he does not exist. At times, questions have been thrown at me. They say, God can do anything. I say, no, he can't do anything. He can do everything. I say, he can't do everything. <laughs> what are you talking about? I said that you see, God, he can't make another God. Can he? He is the uncreated. When he creates, he's a created being. How can he create an uncreated? 
so he can't do, he can't create another God and uncreated. I said he can't kick me out of his kingdom. He can incinerate me, he can abolish me, make me instinct, he can do whatever he likes. But he can't throw me out of his kingdom. Do you know that? Where does his kingdom end? Where is it that you say, now nah, beyond this Allah has, has doesn't, he doesn't operate beyond this. Where? Where? Where can he kick you out of his kingdom? Whatever you think or imagine, shh, it is. So there are things, he says, no, no, no. There's only thing that he does godly things. He can't do things, ungodly things. Kick me out of his kingdom and his kingdom is, permeates everything. But he's not contained. The Islamic concept is that he's not contained in anything. And we are given an ocean of knowledge, the whole complete concept in just four verses, which every Muslim child knows. The Surah Ikhlas. The chapter on purity, Ikhlas. We say, Kul hu Allah. In these four surahs, we are given a concept of God. Every concept, any concept that you can, ha you can imagine, you come with those ideas of yours, either these four verses, in these four verses you'll be able to confirm or reject. There is not a concept that you can think or imagine, that you can think or imagine, which is not covered by these four verses. So our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, that person who reads Surah Ikhlas, he gets one third the sawab, the blessings of reading the whole Quran. One third. Imagine, this is an encyclopedia. Just reading those four verses, once, you get one third. Three times you read, you get the sawab of reading the whole Quran. Only 14 sentences. I'm sorry, 12 sentences. Four at a time, four times three, 12. Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakun lahu kufanad. Repeat it, repeat it. And you got the sawab of reading the whole Quran. Doesn't, how, how do you account for that? How can you account for that? Just reading 12 sentences and you get the blessings of reading the whole book, an encyclopedia. <laughs> how do you grasp that? Our Nabi Karim said so. You know what makes it so important? Those four sentences are the touchstone of theology. Theology, theology is the study of religion. Theos in Greek means God. Theology means the study of God in religion. Theism is the belief in God. Monotheism, to believe in one God. Polytheism, to believe in many gods. Pantheism, to believe everything is God. No, these are theism, theos. A theist who is not a theist who doesn't believe in God. So this, these four verses are the touchstone of theology. There's no concept that you can think or imagine. If you are all right with this four, you have a good idea of what it means. You are safe from any kind of misunderstanding about God. Any kind of misunderstanding. You will be safe with Allah. The right concept. The understanding you have about the four verses. Anybody brings you an idea that God is like this, God is like that. Hmm? Within the four verses, he said, no, no, no. This is rejected. This is rejected. Or oh, this I accept. I accept this. This I reject. This is the touchstone of theology. This is like the, the touchstone that the jewelers use. I had the experience wanting to know about this this is jewelers. You see, you take along your grandma's jewelry, old jewelry. You think it's 22 karat gold. And you get, take it to a jeweler and says, look, I want money for this. So he said, I leave it here. I will test it and let you know what it's worth. You go back the next day, he tells you, no, this thing is here was in 9 karat gold. And it's worth 5,000. So no, 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 my grandma could never own 9 karat gold. 22 karat golds. Get back. Go to another jeweler. He said, look, I want you to cash this for me. I want money for this. So I leave it here. We will test it. And you return after a day or two, and he also gives you almost similar amount to the previous jeweler. He said, this is 9 karat gold. And the next one, he tells you it's 9 karat gold. 
But you see, this jewelry of your grandma, that necklace, they didn't melt it. How do they know that this is nine carat? Everybody says nine carat. Is there a collusion between the jewelers? No, no, no. They have a touch stone, a smooth granite stone, black stone. And they have samples of gold. Nine carat, 12 carat, 18 carat, 22 carat. Pieces of gold, they know, marked. This is nine, this is 18, this is 12, this is 22. Mm -hmm. So you bring your grandma's jewelry and the guy makes it like a pencil mark on that granite stone. And he sees the shade of gold. Mm -hmm. Doesn't look like 22. Looks more like nine. He's got a sample of nine. By the side of it, he makes a line with the nine carat gold. Shh, identical. So he concludes his nine carat. Next jeweler, he says the same. He takes your grandma's jewelry. He makes, rubs it on that granite stone. And then he's got the sample. He says, no, no, this looks like 12. He says, no, 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 the 12 is too bright. This doesn't, it doesn't match. Tries a nine, he says, this is nine. It's nine, it's nine. Touchstone. This is called a touchstone, granite black stone. These four verses are the touchstones of theology. Once you have got the right understanding of this, that is Allah the one and only, Allah Samad, He is eternal, absolute, He does not beget and is not begotten, then there's nothing likened to Him that can be imagined. And that knowledge is given to us in this book of God, the Holy Quran. If you have a translation like this, <laughs> you know, the value, the value. I said you get 12 books of that for this. You get six Qur'ans, 2,000 pages each. Silk paper. Silk paper, six encyclopedias you get for the price of one. For 60 rands, you'll get six of this. Plus that one cent change. <laughs> we'll give you that one cent change, we'll give you that. Six, six encyclopedias, 2,000 pages each, this is 200 pages. 200 pages for 59.99, 60 rands, less one cent. You get six Quran, you get 12 of those other books. But you know, somehow the Muslim is hesitant to own. But if you have this book, this one by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. There are 335 different references about Allah alone, God under the subject God. 335, I counted them this morning. In the index, you go to the index, 335 references about Allah. Allah is mentioned in a concordance, if you have a concordance, 2698 times the word Allah, Allah, Allah occurs in the Quran. But we haven't got the time for all that. 335 times about Allah, things about Allah. This is what he says. For example, He is your protector. Allah is your protector. He is the creator of all. He is most bountiful. He is most merciful. He is most kind. He is forgiving and on. He is the orphan shelter. He is the wondrous guide. He satisfies your needs. He is God. He is present everywhere. To him is the goal. To him is the return of all. His unity. He's one, not one in a trinity. Nor one of two. No begotten son. Nor consort, nor daughters. He has no partners. He is wise. He is the best disposer of affairs. He is most high grade. He is irresistible. He is the doer of all he intends. He is self-sufficient. He is the wisest of judges. He is never unjust. Free of all wants. He is worthy of all praise. 335 different references about God Almighty in this index. You owe it to yourself, Muslims and non-Muslims, to own this book. Ten rands. Ten rands. Ten rands each. Two thousand pages. Silk paper. And everything about God and about life. You know about marriage? You get it in the M. You know about divorce and the D. You know about heaven or hell and the H. You know about Jesus and the J. What do you want to know? Everything on your fingertips. And six of these for one of this. You take your choice. Wa akhirud da'wana ni alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the talk of Sheikh Ahmed Didat. We are open to questions now. 
The mics in front will be used for questioning. Those that want to ask questions pertaining to the subject will be entertained. So you can queue up in front here and you can, you can ask any questions on the subject. Any other questions won't be entertained. I must ask you to cooperate, please. Mr. Didat, in other religions beside Islam, the concept of man becoming God through the pro process of so-called higher knowledge is derogatory to the majesty of God. God was the creator and man was the created. Why has then man made himself, uh, made himself supreme above God? Man, how can he make himself supreme above God? No doubt, he's arrogating to himself the position that he says God does not exist. That he is an atheist. And his mind and whatever he thinks or imagines is his theory of creation, that there is no God. Now, this is a new sickness. This sickness for thousands of years never existed. You see, when Allah Ta'ala gives us in the Quran, the surah, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهُ الْكَافِرُونَ Say, O you who disbelieve. Those people were not atheists. They were not atheists. There were no atheists in Arabia. There were no atheists in India for 5,000 years. There were no atheists in China for thousands of years. In the most primitive nations on earth, there were no atheists. Atheists means people who say there is no God. Everyone they believe in some kind of God that there is some power or something somebody made this and somebody made that wherever in Central Africa or whether in China or in India or Arabia but it is the concept the concept that whenever Nabi Karim Sallallahu put forth the concept of Allah is Wahdaniyat the people said no we believe in 360 gods so no 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 not those 360 shaped like eagles, like lions, like human beings. Mm -hmm. Not this, not that, not that. All this was negative, negated. So the thing is now today in modern times, man has come forth with the idea that as if he created everything. Because he's able to explain, he's trying to give for the theory. The Big Bang theory, this theory, that theory. So from that he assumes that actually as if he made it. Because he's trying to explain how things happen as if he did it. Now, in this book of mine that has been given to you, you'll find there how to talk that type of sick people. You know, the people who say that there is no God, how to reason with him from the Quranic verses that are given to you. So, this is my answer to that. Mr. Did that uh, our host is not here today. Yes. I would like to ask one question. Are you prepared to answer it. No, please. not for him. I have no right to answer yeah. for Swami Agnivesh. Yeah, but... Uh, See, then, I mean, if he was here, you yeah. had a right to ask him. Yeah. The arrangement was that one question for him, one for me. One for him, one for me. Right. This is how it would have been arranged if he was here. But now, you have to reserve your question. Oh, by the way, I'm offering to our Hindu brothers here, because yeah. some of... some people phoned me. A Mr. Maharaj phones me, and he says, you know, this meeting of yours, I said, yeah, this is a symposium going to take place. He said, but this Agnivesh, he says, nobody knows him in India. No, 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 just a human, he says, nobody knows him. I said, there are 800 million Hindus in India. Did you go and test them out? Did you take a poll? 800 million Hindus, and you found out that nobody knows him. <laughs> Surely his, his, his father and mother and his relation, man, somebody must be knowing the guy. But this, this is nature of man. So I'm offering that, look, if this man, they say, actually they say that I have bribed him. You know, might have given him 10,000 rands. Yeah. I said, you come along and make a fool of yourself. And then, you know, I get the credit. No, no, that's it. Imagine people, you know, the type of ideas that they're mooting. I said, now, look, if you have another Hindu gentleman, in South Africa, who can come and speak to the Muslims on the concept of God in Hinduism. I am prepared to give this all free of charge. Any of my Hindu brothers here, please convey it. Any Hindu learned gentleman who want to come along and tell the Muslims the Hindu concept of God, this hall is free for them. 
And I assured them that this hall will be packed. The Muslim will want to hear. We want to hear. Tell us. Officially, you want to get it from the horse's mouth. Mm -hmm. You tell us. We want to listen. That's all. You want to listen. Whether you buy or you don't buy, that's besides the point. See, you listen. We listen to whatever you have to say. And this hall is offered free of charge to any Hindu theologian, Swami, you know, to come along and talk to us. I'll give them this hall free of charge. Right, give somebody else a chance. <laughs> Mr. Did not, uh, the host is not here. No, the host no. is here. No, I'm the host. <laughs> <laughs> the guest is not here. No, no, it's not a very uh, this, uh, question. Under the pretext of religion and civilization, Western world have exploited the under, underprivileged masses of the third world countries. They are doing so today. At present, Islam and Hinduism are at loggerheads. Therefore, sir, which religio religious doctrines have the capabilities whereby man can live in peace and harmony in this turbulent world? This was supposed to be the concept yeah. of God. That's all. The only concept, either from the Swami or from me, the concept of God in Hinduism, the concept of God, not about solving the problem of the world. That's another topic. Mm. That's another subject. Give <laughs> next a chance. Uh, Mr. Dira, I'd like to find out from you, uh, your books say that uh, the, the word Allah uh, was used by the followers of... By? Uh, by the followers of... the word Allah. By? By who? By the followers of Jesus. Uh, oh, right, right. <laughs> by, by, by all the Semitic religions. Yes. I'd by Semitic, I mean the religion of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. Yeah. The word for God Almighty is Allah. That's so, in my book. Yeah, so my question is, uh, how come only the followers of Ishmael have managed to retain the name Allah? Where did the name Allah get lost by the Jews? Yes, and I'll show you. You see, even in the Bible as the Christians have it. You have the Bible here. And in the Bible, if you have, you get one by Reverend Schofield. Translation of the King James Version by Reverend Schofield. And in his first chapter, first verse of the Bible called Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. You see there it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's the first sentence of the Bible. Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. Now, we have a commentary. It has a commentary. Reverend Schofield, backed by eight DDs, not DDs, DDs, <laughs> Doctors of Divinities. Eight DDs. And he gives an explanation that this word God in the Hebrew language is Elohim, which is a uni plural name. And also in Hebrew, El and Elah. And he spells the word Elah. Alternatively, as A L A H. As long as I was reading Ella, Ella, E L A H, E L A H, I couldn't see the connection. That is Allah. But this Reverend Schofield, I have the Bible. If you like to come along and see, I have a photo start of that Bible. I give it to you. It says A L E L A H. Alternatively spelled as A L A H. I said, right. If it's A L A H, is Allah. You say Allah, I say, look, say Allah, my language, my language I want you to pronounce as I want you to pronounce. You see the English language? As the Englishman wanted me to pronounce, I pronounce it. Because when I went to school, in the primary stages of my schooling, I came from India, I didn't know A, B, C, D, I didn't know what a white man looked like, wallah, I didn't know anything. I was like a raw barbarian coming from India into South Africa. Started with A, B, C, D, K, K, G, Aleb, B, T, S, Sh. At the age of nine, I started four languages, one time, learning here, here in South Africa. So at school now, they teach me beauty bats, beauty cat, and beauty mat, and beauty rat, and beauty nut. Beauty? 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 What? Boot! <laughs> you know, that's, that's funny. I'm telling my teacher, sir, this is very funny. You know, it's a beauty bats, beauty cat, and beauty mat, and beauty nut. Beauty? Us? No, 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 no. It doesn't agree with me. I say, did that. Don't try to be too clever. Hmm? Beauty is put. 
And if you don't say put, you won't pass your exams. So I said put and I passed my exams. <laughs> so I said, look, A-L-A-H is Allah. Say Allah. You try. And you say Allah. I said, no, no, try again. You say Allah. I said, not Allah. Say Allah. You say Allah. I said, okay. I, I, I forgive you. I forgive you. You see, the word is Allah. So in the language of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, the word for God Almighty is Allah. Jesus Christ, supposed to be on the cross, he cried out with a loud voice. He said, Allah, Allah, lama sabachtani. Allah, Allah, lama taraktani. In, in Arabic, in Hebrew, Allah, Allah, lama sabachtani. In the, in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, it speaks about John the disciple. He saw as the vision in heaven. Angels singing in heaven. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. I'm asking the Christians, what is alleluia? Hmm? Hippie puree. Is that being hippie puree? <laughs> so, yeah, God made another star. 40,000 40, times brighter than our sun. So what the angel said? Hippie puree, alleluia, alleluia. I said, is that what they're doing? I said, no, no, no. I said, what is alleluia? The first time these people, the Christian, came to the city hall lectures of mine and they said, Alleluia! Alleluia! So I explained what Alleluia is. No more Alleluias. Finish. <laughs> Nobody says Alleluia anymore. Because you see, you are saying, Ya Allahu, Alleluia. Is Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu. Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu. This is what you are supposed to be singing. The angels singing in heaven. Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu. Ya, ya Allahu, Ya Allahu. This is it. I said, you, this is what you're saying. Hooray. Congratulations to you. You are still thinking of Allah. Ya Allahu. Alleluia is Ya Allahu. Ya Allahu. So, this word is still in the Bible, in every Bible, in every language. In the Zulu Bible is there. In the Khaza Bible is there. There is not a Bible in which this word Allah is not there. You come along and I'll show them to you. Yes, my son. Oh, yeah. <coughs> okay, you said that um, um, if... You said that you know you have the, your own concept of God, and then your own concept of God, you get that you've got attributes that uh, are referred to by you from the Quran. What about the religions that are not having references, like the African religions? Do you think that, that they are in the right direction? Secondly, shall um, we have one at a time? One question at a time. Will allow you the second question? So make me, no, no. Stay, you, you can, stay, you, just stay you can come back you. again behind the queue. You can ask the second question. We'll give you that right. But let me answer the first. First, I will answer that first. Yes. The, the my son is asking, what about the African religions? I says, you know, actually the African religions is no different from Islam. Allah, the concept. I'm talking about the concept. I'm asking an old Zulu. This umveling gangi. For God Almighty, this umveling gangi. Unkulunkulu means the greatest of the great. It's not a name. Unkulunkulu means the biggest of the biggest. The mightiest of the mighty. It's not a name. The name for God Almighty among the Zulus is umveling gangi. So I'm asking an old Zulu, what is umveling gangi? So he tells me, I'm He is a pure and holy spirit. A gazalian, he He does not beget and is not begotten. Futi, a guhlutul of ananaye. I said, have you been reading the Quran? So what's that? No, no, he never heard the Quran. He never heard the name Quran. But he's giving me what I gave you from Surah Ikhlas. He's giving me the translation of Surah Ikhlas in his language. He's a Muslim. I go to the Sudan. I learned the language of the Dinka before going. <laughs> Amazing thing, you know. The Sudanese people don't know the language of the Dinka. Like you here, you live among the Zulus and you don't know Zulu. That's, you should be ashamed of ourselves, I tell you. You live among the Zulus, you do business with the Zulus and you don't know Zulu, there's something wrong with you. I go to Sudan on a lecture tour and before going I learned the language of the Dinka. John Garam. And the Sudanese Muslims are at war. It's going on for years now. So, I learned the language of the Dinka. And now I want to practice. As soon as I land there in Khartoum, at the hotel, I go to the reception and say, you know, I was trying to learn your language. No, that's a hobby with me. No, it's a hobby with me. I learn different languages. I can give you 20 different languages now, standing here. 20 different languages. Besides Zulu and Afrikaans. 20 different languages. Swahili, French, Spanish. Indonesian, Malaysian, come on man, talk, what language, Hebrew, what language you want to hear? No, that's a hobby with me. So whenever I go to a new country, I learn the language of the people. So I learn the Dinka language. So I go to these guys, 
And I said, you know, I learned your language. I said, yes. I said, listen, see if I'm doing all right. I said, yeah. I said, apiata batin, we yake lik eat, apiata inunu kwik, tijal an, nasha jil, kedu jil ashibu inunu kwik, kunalar, hikabatuj, inunu kwik. He said, no, that's my, not, not my language. That's the language of that guy there, Dunka. <laughs> that, uh, uh, the porter, the porter. He was standing there, tall, African. This is the language of that guy there. So I go to him. I said, you know, I come from South Africa, and I learned your language. I said, I want you to hear. And you know, I want you to help me. If I'm murdering your language, forgive me. It's not intentional. So I rattled it off. He says, very good. He said, where do you learn this from? I said, learn it from the Holy Bible. I said, hey, tell me now, before the white bus came here to your country, did you people know anything about God? He said, yes. I said, did you make a statue of your God? He says, no. I said, could you not people out of a wood carve out the shape of a man or an animal, lion or a donkey? He said, yes, yes. Or out of clay, could you not make the shape of a man or a woman? He said, yes. So why didn't you make a statue of your God? He says, how, sir? How can you make a statue of God? He is Nihalik. I says, what is Nihalik? What is Nihalik? In your language. He said, it means light. How can you make a statue of light? You know what he's telling me? He's telling me, Allah who nur samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. He's telling me in his own language that he is light. How can you make a statue of light? I say, he's a Muslim. And we say, he's a kafir. No, no, it's a sickness, man. Learn to find common grounds. Talk to the people, man. What is this concept? And you find that he's talking what you want to tell him. He's telling you, Allah who nur samawati wal ard. We should have gone and told him that that is what the Quran says. That he is the light of the heavens and the earth. The Nihalik in his language is nur. I says, you see, there is the African, to me, the African, almost every tribe that I know, south of the Zambezi, not a single tribe made images of their gods. Not a single tribe. As such, they were better than the Jews. The Jews, after hundreds of prophets coming to them, they were warned again and again that thy God is a jealous God. He shall have no other gods before him, not even the likeness of the things on earth, or in the heavens above, or in the waters beneath the sea. For he says, my name is, I am a jealous God. I shall have no other God before me. Yet they made the golden calf. The Jews. The Africans, they made no images, no statues of their gods. They are nearer to, the, to Islam than any other people, Allah. But I don't know, we are so blind, we can't see it. Talk to them, man, talk to them. Show the common grounds. That this is the same God. We want you to go back to the same concept that you had before the white bass came. Before he twisted your brains. Go back. And by going back, you're going forward. Yes, my son. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Jiyaz. Uh, I believe the Pope is arriving soon to, to South Africa. Are you prepared to meet him? I'll be very happy. I had sent a letter to him that, Your Holiness, you're talking about a dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. You know, he's talking about dialogues. He went to Turkey. He said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Nigeria, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Kenya, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. He went to Morocco, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. I said, come, Your Holiness, let us have a dialogue. That's a big story. That's another big story. <laughs> no, no. Also in this book, uh, inshallah, when I, in September, when I return from England, I might deliver a lecture on this book. Islam's answer to the Pope's pious pronouncements. There'll be a lecture, inshallah, in this hall. You know? He's talking about dialogue here, in this book as well. That we must have a dialogue with the followers of the Prophet. In this book, in this latest book of his. So he said, then I offered this in the daily, in the Sunday Tribune. I said, look man, come on man. Your Pope says we must have a dialogue. And I'm looking for a bishop or an archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church or the Anglican Church or the DRC. Come and let us have a dialogue. But no, they want to come and knock at your door. Catch you out one by one. Because you're ignorant. You don't know. You have no knowledge. You want to push things down your throat. I said, come and talk, man. There'll be, I can get 40,000 people in the King's Park. Is that King's Park? Hmm? 40,000 Hindus, Muslims, and Christians, and Jews. 40,000 people at my expense. Come and talk to them. You want a dialogue? Come and let's have a dialogue in public. They're silent as church mice. <laughs> Namaste, Mr. Dad. Nice to meet you. My name is Diamond Lal. I'm from USA. And I would like to ask you a couple of questions, sir. Not a couple, uh, only one. One, okay. Uh, you said that the Lord Almighty is in every, everything within the cosmos, 
He and permits. He, he, he permits, he permits everything. everything. Does he also permit in in the fear, uh, in the within the cosmic too? Does he permit there in the in the? I I have a little poem. I think you're giving me an opportunity. William Wordsworth, the British poet, he describes it, and this is truly Islamic. William Wordsworth, he says in his Tintern Abbey, his book of poetry called Tintern Abbey, he says about God, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean and the living air, and in the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. <laughs> this is Islam. It happens to be William Wordsworth who said it, but it's fitting. It's describing what I wanted to say and what you are asking. His dwelling is the light of setting sun. He doesn't reside there. He's not located there. But figuratively, his dwelling is the light of setting suns. And the round ocean and the living air and in the blue sky and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things. All objects of all thought and rolls through all things. I think he describes it beautifully. <laughs> Yes, this is the last question. Yeah, and good. after that, I'll ask my sisters for that 100 ran. I, I don't want to take it back with me. I want to give it to somebody that 100 ran. You see? For two reasons why a Muslim is not likely to have this book. Two reasons why a Muslim is not likely to have this book. The Pope's book. Two reasons. No, please. No, please. Please, my brothers. Please, you'll forgive me. Please, this is the last question. I mentioned this is the last question. Please. All good things have an end. Otherwise, we can carry on till midnight. Yes, my Yeah, Mr. Didat, like, you know, in South Africa, like in countries like America, you know, there are those countries that are highly industrializing. We find that the rate of unemployment, you know, increases and that it results in a high rate of crime, poverty, diseases, all those things, as we find it happening in South Africa. Then how can Islam or Islam in association with other religions uh, uh, can address these problems? What can they do in order to address the problem, especially uh, to the historically disadvantaged people of this country who are the, only, who are the majority who are in starvation? You see, the way we can establish the kingdom of God on earth is to follow his instructions. Mankind wants peace, but he does not want to be tied down to any law. He wants to be free. He wants to make laws for everybody else, but he wants to have the license to do what he likes. He wants to behave like an animal. The laws of God in the Quran and the Bible, they're giving remedies to your sicknesses. In the Bible and the Quran. And maybe in the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana. I don't know. If Swami Sahib was here, he might have helped us. But now I said, this is all in your book. The Christian, you said you got it in your book. But you don't want to follow it. Jesus said, Jesus said, if the eye offends you, cast it out. If the hand offends you, cut it off. Did your Jesus say that? Is this not in your book? No, no. <laughs> you see, it could have other meanings. Ambiguities. When they talk about, so look, he said in clear cut language that if the eye offends you, meaning if this eye of yours is lasting, hmm? every woman that passed by, you give a second look and you stare and you feast and the thought goes through your mind. Jesus said, you are already guilty of adultery. He said, it has been said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. Did he say that? Your God, did he say that? Then how could you have long leg contest and beauty contest and beach bum contest? No, 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 you tell me. Hmm? No, no, this is what Jesus, this is your Lord says, your God says. And this eye of yours is causing you to do this, it will take you to hell. Rather than that happen, take it out. Take it out and throw it away. This hand is going, going to fondle other people's wives and daughters. It will take, lead you to hell. Cut it off, man. Cut it off. This is what... The teachings are there, but you don't want to follow any one of them. They call the Muslims barbarians. For certain crimes, we say chop of the guy's hands. For certain other crimes, I chop of his head, man. No, 
This guy here, a rapist, the guy who, who killed six children, six children. He's got six life year sentences, six, from the age of two to 12. Six girls, I think, he killed. And he's enjoying now what is called a six life sentences. You know what it means? That if the guy dies and comes back, put him in life sentence. And he, <laughs> he put him back and he dies and he's born again. Put him again. What the hell are you talking about? That guy will be out in 20 years time for good behavior and write his memoirs and make a million out of that. <laughs> you know, this is your culture. You are inviting all this. Go to the Bible. Go to your Bible, man. You don't want to touch the Quran, don't touch the Quran. Come. I show you your Bible, what your Bible says. But no, you don't want to know your Bible. Because your Bible will take, bring you to the Quran. <laughs> yes, my sisters, my daughters, that 100 runs. 100 runs. Two reasons, two reasons why a Muslim is not likely to have this book. Because Good. the Quran and the Hadith, we don't need this book. Anybody else? Sorry. Two reasons. Because we haven't been educated to, know, to, to learn more about other religions, but when we talk to people from other faiths, to be able to converse with them and perhaps bring them around to Islam, because, because of the ignorance that we are in, we don't want to know anything else about any other religion. That's one reason. And the second reason also could be that because we have found in what we have, that there's no need to search for something else. Next one. Anybody else, please. I, I don't want to take this 100 run back. I want to leave it to my daughters. I want to give to one of my child here. Come, come, come. Please, try, try, try. Very easy. Wallah, it's very easy. As a matter of fact, I told you already. I told you already. Come, 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 come. Huh? It's too expensive. Come, 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 come. Two reasons. Two reasons. All right, I won't keep in one, one last try, please. Take it, I want to give this money. All right, you, you, my brothers, come on. For you as well. Two reasons why a Muslim is not likely to have this book. Two reasons. Let me try. Yes. One is written by a Christian. Two is too expensive. Next one, next one. Next one. Mixed marriage. Mixed marriage. What you find in that book is not in this book. What you find in this book is not that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And what you find in that book is already in the front. And what you find in that book is already in the front. The man is a hypocrite. He knows the truth. He doesn't want to reveal it. Now I give you. Now I take you out of your suspense and put my money back in my pocket. <laughs> you see, we Muslims are a La Ikra community. Means we are a people who don't read. We are not a reading people, number one. We don't even read newspapers. Do you know that? <laughs> That's one reason. We are not a reading people. No Muslim magazine can survive in South Africa without charity. Do you know that? The Al Kalam, charity. Anything else, charity. You don't subscribe for any newspapers. You go and ask my friend, Mr. Mohammed Makki, the Muslim Digest, how he struggles to keep it alive. Not because you, you, no, you don't subscribe for things. You expect the guy to come along and persuade you to get the money out of you. You are not a reading people. We are not a reading people. We are a laikra community. The first word of Rawahi, Allah gives our Nabi and through him to us is ikra, read. And we would say laikra, don't read. <laughs> no, that's kufr, but we don't say that. But in our life, we are a, not a reading people. Number one reason, we are not a reading people. Number two, Fifty-nine ninety-nine. <laughs> <laughs> Two reasons. Really this, uh, this is the answer I wanted from you. Number one, we are not a reading people. And number two, fifty-nine ninety-nine. Two Some of them said, you said that, but I, I wanted this too. We are not a reading people, and we are, this fifty-nine ninety-nine is, is a rip-off. It's a rip-off. And we don't want to be ripped off. <laughs> We'll end with the dua. We'll end with the dua. Nabi wa ahli bayti al-kiram al-fatiha
الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم ربنا تقبل منا فإنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم اللهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم اللهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم اللهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا ذلك الفضل من الله وكفى بالله عليما ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد اللهم اجعل هذا جمعنا جمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما اللهم اشرح صدورنا بالإسلام اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان اللهم حبب إلينا الإسلام اللهم حبب إلينا القرآن وزينهم في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والظلم والعصيان وجعلنا يا الله من الراشدين وجعلنا يا الله من المؤمنين وجعلنا يا الله من المتقين وجعلنا يا الله من الصابرين وجعلنا يا الله من الموحدين وجعلنا يا الله من الموحدين وجعلنا يا الله من الموحدين وجعلنا يا الله من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه أولئك الذين هداهم الله وأولئك هم أولو الألباب وجعلنا يا الله من الهادين مهتدين غير ضالين ولا مضلين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك أنبنا وإليك المصير ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ودخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين قال الله تعالى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وأصحابه وبارك وسلم اللهم افتح لنا بالخير واختم لنا بالخير واجعل أواقب أمورنا بالخير بيدك الخير إنك على كل شيء قدير ألا إن أولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون بفضل سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين